Hello SGD, Sacred Geometry Decoded. This will be part two in this little micro series, bit of a detour from where I'm working at the moment, but it is connected. Uh, so it has to do a lot with archaeoastronomy, but also how the architecture also relates to the symbolism, especially the afterlife and the pyramid text and specifically the opening of the mouth ceremony. Uh, in part five of this recent series, uh, for instance, I mentioned um, Elephantine, and towards the end of that episode, I'll put the link in the description, I went through some of uh, the uh, papers, especially uh, by the teams that have been led by um, Juan Belmonte, and looking at the ancient Egyptian temples from Lower Egypt, Upper Egypt, and into the Sudan, as well as uh, oases and desert regions. and. Uh, he did quite a wide study of these and was looking at their uh, alignments uh, specifically to solstice, equinox and also to Sirius and uh, Canopus, the brighter stars in the sky. Uh, what I touched on but didn't go into was the importance of the Big Dipper, which is in the Ursa Major, the Big Bear constellation, which is one of the oldest um, verified Egyptian constellations that was is the Big Bear, it's essentially pointing to the North Star. We still use the Big Dipper to find the North Star. And so there's part of a paper, and so there's the constellation, the Big Bear and the Big Dipper, and how that relates. So you can just see how that constellation connects to uh, Mesquite. You will also get to this particular collection of glyphs as well. But this ever so important constellation, the Big Dipper, or, or a cluster, uh, within the constellation, and it's still essential to us now, it's to find the North Star. Uh, finding East-West is much more difficult now, you could use the equinoxes, but you have only two times a year to do that, but every night the, the North Stars are there, they, they're the immortal for navigation, for temple alignments. Once you find North, you can then find north, south, east, west very easily and the north stars are always there. This will also relate back to uh, Sheset and the stretching the cord ceremony, the emblem of Sheset. So this is from the Palermo stones and we also have um, references to the stretching the cord ceremony, the foundation ceremony of uh, creating a temple where the actual alignments and the floor plan is created even before construction begins, the survey of a temple and to find the alignment is the crucial step in this and the stretching the cord ceremony goes back a very very long time including um, Casa Kemwe as we'll see here so this is from Temple of Edfu we see stretching the cord there it's hard to find a temple which doesn't have a, a similar image to this stretching the cord but also the oldest so we have written the picture uh, stories of it but we also have the imagery so this is a Tol uh, Ptolemaic era, but going back to um, very, very early in a, a recorded Egyptian history. This is from a door jam in um, Hierakonopolis and uh, Kasset Kemwe. And we see again the stretching the cord ceremony. So a cord, there are two stakes are hammered into the ground, wrapped by a cord. And that finds the alignment of the temple and the first step. So now it has to do with North. So as a general, almost as, with a very few exceptions, uh, not, no, no, actually probably no real exceptions, but all pyramids are aligned to the North. So the three main pyramids, uh, famous ones, all their entrances are, are on the North side. This is a, essentially a constant. Now there are a couple of exceptions, we'll get to those, but uh, the importance of aligning to the north and, and how you would do that and that's because well it relates to stretching the cord ceremony so uh, I have grasped the stake with the handle of the mallet so here the goddess Sheset which is the goddess geometry, astronomy, arithmetic um, all, all things scholarly uh, and she would assist the pharaoh in this important ceremony of finding the alignments of, of a new temple stretching the cord, I have grasped the stake with the handle of the mallet. I take the measuring cord in the company of Sheset, she's just like Foth, she's the 
female counterpart of Fofa. The cord was 100 Egyptian raw cubits. In this series, Unlocking the Giza Plateau, I've been looking uh, how important this particular measurement is and how it relates to not just the Giza pyramids but and their larger plan, but also to well, all these other places as well. So then I observed the progressive movements of stars. So this is a, if you take a time lapse, point your camera towards the north, you'll see how you know, each night the stars will all turn, spin around. The, the North Star. So the North Star is the immovable, unmoving star. It sits there and all the stars move around it. So the progressive movement of the stars. My eye is now fixed upon Mesket or Mesketu. This important constellation, the guide of timekeeping, stands by me in front of his Merkit. Now we'll get to that as well. Then I have established the four corners of your temple. So this is the crucial, vital step in any temple alignment and therefore the archaeoastronomy and it literally says uh, the, the connections to Mesketu. We can also clearly de shown in the architecture uh, across Egypt as well. Now what is Mesketu? It's the bull's foreleg. It's actually uh, connected to Set. So Set killed Osiris. Uh, these pieces were put into a coffin and they were floated down the Nile. As one story goes, they floated to Byblos in current day Lebanon. There, uh, Isis um, and Horus found them, brought it back, and uh, resurrected Osiris, who you know, the, the king represents Osiris. So, a northern alignment. So, for instance, at the Step Pyramid, there is this, uh, what they call the Serdab, and we have this strangely angled um, box, but inside the box we have two holes, and they're looking out, and they're pointed to north. This is a constant, and so for instance, not just for instance the Pyramid of Neferefre, one of these uh, unfinished or dismantled pyramids, depends on your interpretation of that. Now there were, uh, pyramids were dismantled, reused, temples would be um, dismantled and reused during Egyptian times as well, as well as in the Ptolemaic and Roman era as well. For instance, how many come out uh, the Romans dismantled what was left of the pyramid it was already pretty much gone by by that time but the uh, reusing of stones is, again is a sort of constant throughout this period uh, for instance uh, Akhenaten you know every all traces of him were wiped um, out and there were other temples as well it wasn't not just a, a later period it was, seems to have been a, something that went throughout um, most of Egyptian history at least but it is aligned to the north uh, Abu Rawash is another one of these um, dismantled or unfinished pyramids and again the main entrance is aligned to the north. These are just two examples, it's a constant. So when it comes to the pyramids, now all the grand pyramids are in Lower Egypt, they're all on the west bank of the Nile and they're all between the delta and the canal entrance to Lake Morris. So Sinosret uh, in El Luhan, and even the na ancient name of this town uh, is the canal opening into Lake Morris. And so b basically from there up to Abu Wash, pretty much the most northerly pyramid, all the grand pyramids of Egypt are in in this position. And since they're on the west bank of Nile, the, the pyramids are linked to the setting sun rather to the rising sun. And this is an important aspect, especially in regards to Arquette and that symbolism there. There are some large pyramids in northern Sudan uh, or Nubia, so the El uh, Kuru and the Nuri pyramids. Uh, but when it comes to the Egyptian pyramids, they're all located there between the canal opening to Lake Morris and the beginnings of the Nile Delta. Uh, an interesting, so in part two of the series Unlocking the Plateau, I looked at uh, one of these papers, and so the original Giza, the pyramids, the Sphinx, uh, and Kent Cowley's tomb slash pyramid were all actually natural features, and they were expanded upon. So the pyramids of Khufu and Khafre, as they're called, were actually on a natural mound to, to begin with. Now Abu Ruwash is the same thing where the, there's still a natural mound, a natural hill from which the pyramid began construction and Sinosra II, the most southerly of these pyramids, uh, although it's still got some of these um, uh, uh, mud brick around it, but that 
once you filled the strip a bit of that away, that is still a natural hill. Now, most uh, lean think that it was a, a, an effort to save energy and construction that probably come into it, but the importance of pyramids being natural hills and you know that they already have an important connection to the religion and the the landscape prior to the architecture being added to them. Now it's also interesting to note that this most southerly pyramid is the only pyramid which has a southern um, opening. So all pyramids uh, have their opening to the north, uh, with re very few exceptions. So the Pyramid of Ameni Kamau, uh, the, the open opening was to the east. However, it was such a bad state of construction. Maybe there was a northern opening that could have been lost, but there was an opening to the east. The Bent Pyramid has a northern opening, but there's also a shaft that leads off to the west, but still it's northerly. But the uh, Sinestrot II pyramid, um, it has an opening to the south. And one of the explanations is it was a, an attempt to uh, stop tomb robbing. But the makers, like it would have been, you know, it was not just one or two people building it. I, I think that that's probably got, being the most southerly pyramid, that it's the only one with a, that opens to the south. I think there'd be something to consider in there as well. But uh, who's to say without the text at this moment? But when we come back to Mesquetu stretching the cord ceremony and Mesquetu being the Big Dipper, the north, the, the, the stars which point us to the north. So the emblem of Sheset, there's uh, connections. So the to God of timekeeping stands uh, by me in front of his murket. Well, this is a murket. This can also be used as a sundial. Uh, for instance, Temple of Seti the First in his uh, tomb, there is a, a description of how to make a sundial, which follows, which looks like a merkit. But a merkit can also be used to measure time by night. So by both in in the day, you lay it down and you orientate it properly. You can make a sun clock, sundial, but also a, a star clock by night as well. And also this emblem of Shesset relating to this instrument called the Merkit, where we use a plumb line and when we use a sighting tool and then we can also find north. Now this image is, uh, I'll put this link in the description as well by uh, Belmonte, Juan Belmonte looking at it. So this is the Big Dipper. Now we would follow these two stars to the, to the pole star, the north star currently. In the past you would use those as a, your sighting tool and in regards to the Merkit as well and the use of a plumb line, so this instrument here where we just have a stake with a slit as a siding tool and then we use a plumb line to find because it's going to be straight. Um, very simple but uh, but the simplicity of a plumb line is also what makes it such a, an effective powerful tool in surveying. Also work, so Sheset, guidance of geometry, astronomy, weights and measures and the emblem, so weight and balance. You now she was also the scribe, now that um, post there in the middle of the scales is also it's the scribe's tool as well. And also we have the measurer of the hour, there we can see a merket, now seat or throne and then an instrument for measuring. So a merket, plumb line hanging off this instrument to as a measuring that to measure the hour and we also have an instrument for measuring and again just a plumb line hanging off a rod as we see here which brings us back to Mesquetu and now we'll look at the stretching the cord ceremony ceremony northern alignments and how it connects to the opening the mouth ceremony and how this archaeo astronomy symbolism so important in architecture is also embedded in the rituals of the pyramid text, the coffin text and the book of the dead and, and the mummification rituals. So the opening the mouth ritual or the opening the mouth ceremony and how it connects to the resurrection of Osiris and so essentially the, the bull's foreleg mesquetu relates to Set 
and the spirit bear guards it. Now the great bear of the northern sky, the great hippopotamus goddess keeps hold of it and so it will no longer sail in the midst of the gods. Now, so the big bear as we call it now and then we have the big dipper currently that points to Polaris, the current North Star and it was not too, well it's an important tool in the past and there's some confusion in um, and people are skeptical of it but it's just because it's a uh, well it's a simple mistake and that's because they're looking at Musketu as the depictions and not realizing that so often constellations that so this is a constellation globe and all the constellations on the globe are going to be in reverse to the constellation art that is seen looking above so on a constellation globe Leo looks to as we see there Leo looks in this direction just like um, the lion Leo is in that direction but these depictions are God's eye views there as as it would be projected down onto the earth so all you need to do is essentially is flip the image around and there we find that Musketu fits onto the Big Bear or the Big Dipper quite well and so now we have a reason for this confusion with Musketu in the past so now those lines would point to Polaris, the current North Star. Previously it would point to Koshab, the, previ the older North Star. And Tuban, which was a star, North Star 1800 BC to 3900 BC, give or take a small fraction. That would also fit in that line. So Tuban is now on Draco, Constellation. Polaris and Koshab are on the Little Bear constellation, Ursa Minor. So now it would be a... So there's axial precession, there's equinoctial precession. Axial precession is the movement of the North Star in this great cycle as it moves around. And in the past, of course, so currently Ursa Major, or which is the Big Dipper in the Big Bear, points to Polaris, North Star as it is now. And in the past we see how it would closely connect or you know, actually especially in regards to Tuban would actually describe the North Star uh, 1800 BC to 3900 BC or during that period. Mesketu is the Big Dipper and it is still now and it was one of the best ways to find the North Star. I'll post this paper by Belmonte in regards to Shesset and stretching the chord ceremony it shows how this instrument which follows uh, the depiction of Sheset as a goddess um, could, is used as a, or it's a very simple but very powerful sighting tool to find north and of course uh, Tuban and Koshab are uh, the alignments there in the Great Pyramid and that's how it lines up. So Musketu uh, is, my eye is now fixed upon Musketu, I shall observe the progressive movements of the stars. It fits in perfectly with the architecture and of course these descriptions once you include the fact that the North Stars are very dim and that still now we use the Big Dipper to find and sight the North Stars. So why are all pyramids aligned to the North? Well I'll look into the pyramid texts um, which really begin with Unas. Now in there for instance uh, you shall become clean in the waters of the stars and board the sun boat on cords of metal on the shoulders of Horus in his identity of the one who is in Sokar's boat. The population will cry out to you once the imperishable stars have raised you aloft. The imperishable stars, well, they're, they're the northern stars and they're the immortal stars, they're the very important ones. Uh, I think this is also important because in the recent series I've been mentioning this Susan Bryn Morrow has been looking at the pyramid texts and reading them in regards to the actual natural cycles, the archaeoastronomy of Egypt, and she's presented a new translation which is much less mystical and m much more scientific, an actual description of the natural world. Uh, she received a bit of pushback, especially from James P. Allen. I'll, I'll now link his um, translation of the pyramid text now he's it is a trans he says what he said about Susan Bryn Morrow he likened her work, translation to the work of amateurs 
and called it a serious misrepresentation of a pyramid's text of the pyramid texts. It is a translator's job to be as faithful to the original as possible while also using words and constructions that make sense to more, modern readers. Miss Morrow has not done that. Her translation is basically a poet's interpretation of what she thinks the text should say, not a reflection of what they actually say. Well, I would say that he is the one, because I'll put his link to his paper, one of his uh, works on the translation. In the preface, he, he describes words such as arket and ark and puts them in a purely spiritual light, as where uh, both the archaeoastronomy, the architecture, the natural rhythms of ancient Egypt, including the, the, the seasons, the flood seasons, the field of reeds, which was a mirror image of the life of the afterlife, being a mirror image of the, the seasons of the real world. Uh, there is, well, you know, it's what's not in his in his preface and the words and how he compares words such as Ark and Arquette. He is being very, very poetic. He is assuming a lot and it doesn't include any archaeoastronomy it doesn't it barely touches the importance of the seasons and and the flood cycles as were her interpretation uh, translation actually does match the natural cycles the architecture and descriptions such as in other texts such as the stretching the cord ceremony um yeah like that they were not uh purely mystical superstitious people their religion and their architecture uh it, it just blends perfectly together um I, f I think that he's the one who's actually misrepresenting and um and well the, the lack of any archaeoastronomy uh the the lack of the comparison of the architecture to the descriptions in the pyramid text i think speak quite strongly against him and speak quite strongly uh, against her I mean sorry again for her proposition in regards to reading the pyramid text as a description of the natural world and of course that's just really just backed up by the architecture more and more work into the archaeoastronomy has established this now in the in the translation what is repeated very very often is the for instance the imperishable star Imperishable star, imperishable star, imperishable star. Orion and and Sophus or Orion and Sirius are mentioned, but when it comes to the destination and the importance of Artum, uh, when in the first part of this I spoke about Artum as the creator god of the Ennead, well, what are the imperishable stars? And well, that's. Well, the imperishable stars are the immortal stars that are visible all year round. They are the north stars. So in the stretching the cord, my eye is fixed on Mesketu, the north star. That's how we find our alignments. We can use the equinox, but the north star is there every night. It is the, they are the imperishable, the immortal stars. This is the Dendera zodiac. This is from the Ptolemaic era. So, um, a lot more has crept into there. We basically have the 12 signs of a modern uh, Babylonian Greek zodiac in there. But in the centre we have the imperishable stars. Now the Egyptians divided the stars into two main groups, the imperishable stars and then the unwearying stars. The, the stars that did not get tired, such as Orion, Sirius, or the, the stars of constellations such as Taurus, etc. They're moving all the time, not just through the night, but throughout the year. The, the 12 signs of a zodiac are not visible all year round. They come and they go. They're always on the move. But the imperishable stars are immortal. The, the North Star is always there. And that's what we see depicted in there. So these are the imperishable stars. And on this illustration, we get a better view of them. But we have the hippopotamus and the bull's foreleg, as well as the ads. So the ads is the actual northern star, the north pole and Mesketu, the bull's foreleg, which is guarded by the hippopotamus, points to those and that's still used in navigation now. So this is from another de t depiction of a tomb and this here we see Mesketu and the seven stars connected therein, the bull's foreleg uh, related to the Osiris um, resurrection story, this uh, lady next to, well, that represents to suspend, to stretch out the sky and Ak again, which 
I'll link James P. Allen's description of there. He always puts, you know, he criticizes Bryn Morrow, but he's he he. It's pure religion in his translations, absolutely pure. But the again, archaeoastronomy studies uh, the texts themselves, the architecture. If you're not including that in your translation, um, and I must say, I'm not. You know, I've, he's much more knowledgeable in reading hieroglyphs however interpreting them he, he has a very narrow view I, I you know I don't like to say that but that's just you know that's it's evident so we'll see it in other um, tombs and depictions so for instance this one we see the 36 decans these so there were 10 weeks 10 times sorry 10 day week 10 times 36 is 360 plus the five day intercalary period but also the division into 24 but what we have these older Egyptian depictions don't put them in a circle the way we would be more familiar with to, to look at uh, constellation charts they did theirs a little bit differently but if we close in again now we see the crocodile on the back of the hippopotamus with the blade which guards the bull the bull's foreleg which is a Sketu, the North Star so the, the depictions again will vary slightly. Again, the hippopotamus with the blade tethered to the bull or musketu, the crocodile on its back, and we see also these two variations of that. But the same thing's happening. And if we do a comparison, so we focused in on this portion, focused in, you can even see that the uh, hieroglyph again matches with the three foxes tied the disc and the bird there so that's a uh, that's musketu which will relate to the opening of the mouth ceremony as written in the pyramid text as well as coffin text and the book of the dead or coming forth by day but especially the pyramid text such as this pyramid text of unas and the ritual that goes into uh, this mummification resurrection ceremony because essentially it was uh, the tombs would be filled with furniture and the daily tools of, of life because the afterlife was a reflection of the living world as in the field of reeds uh, depictions in the translations of the pyramid text and the opening of a mouth ceremony you'll also find where there's multiple references to natron and the importance of that in so many aspects but it also involved a uh, ritual killing of various animals, or a typo there, but of special importance was the uh, slaying of two bulls, and that this relates to here this opening the mouth ceremony and to the constellation Mesketu. So, on these particular images, well, what you'll see here's another example of the opening the mouth and the, the bulls and the animals highlight on these portions, and we start with the heart and the fore, foreleg of a bull are offered up in um, in the ceremony now also see these ritual ads as well that the foreleg of a bull so where we see the crown is pointed towards the mouth which is opening the mouth and the bull's foreleg also the, these implements used in there the ritual ads so foreleg of a bull but also the ads. This is a, a depiction of the field of reeds or marsh of reeds. This is a depiction of the Egyptian afterlife where we have an exact reflection of the living world where we see Arket, the flood season, the um, then Peret, the emergence or growth season, and then Shemu, the dry or harvest season. But more importantly, at the very top there, we also see the opening the mouth ceremony in that same instrument. And there we see how it uh, uh, applies. This was one found, I believe it was at the mortuary temple of Hapshetsut. They have very older ones where again we see the bull's foreleg that this was uh, so important in the mummification uh, process and the rituals involved therein. And what it, what it is, it's well, it's actually it's the Big Dipper, it's the north, it's this, the constellation must get you, which points to the north star. The instrument itself, again, the bull's foreleg, um, might be, people might think it's a, like a, uh, what's that, um, uh, a lily, uh, 
but again the bull's heart there in the center, the bull's foreleg, and also the musketu instrument is what it's also referred to as well. So the architecture, the, the text, including the alignment of temples, such as in the stretching the cord ceremony, the pyramid, coffin text, and book of the dead, the opening the mouth ceremony, um, Sheset, even in the Book of the Dead, is the one who opens the door for you in the afterworld. Uh, this is a part of a sphinx found in Israel. Most likely it came from Heliopolis because of the inscription. Um, it included Menkara's name, but beloved by the divine manifestation that gave him eternal life, indicating it's from the ancient city of Heliopolis, primary shanks, uh, sanctuary of Sheset, the birthplace of the gods of Yeniad. But also on the inscriptions, uh, you'll see this is the back pillar from the Temple of Luxor. And there we see that portion. Well, it's the same. But also, there we have Mesketu. That's another version, depiction of the constellation Mesket, or Mesketu, the Great Bear, pointing to the Northern Stars. And just above it as well, we see the actual implement once again, which matches the bull's foreleg. And why are all these pyramids, all these temples, all the connections to the North Star? Well, it's the immortal stars, the imperishable stars. It's where Artum, the father of the Ennead, um, reigns. And so what you're actually seeing in these depictions is, again, there is astronomical connections via the architecture and the texts itself. Text itself, which sort of brings us back to that Susan Bryn Morrow versus James P. Allen. Now, was it a religion with science or was it purely just a religion? Well, I think it's a great disservice to the um, Egyptians because they were clearly very, very, very intelligent people to be able to build the temples and the, the pyramids they, um, and the natural seasons and the astronomy connected to them and the observations which are found in all these other texts all point back to this and there is a I think it's the uh, just more and more the, the study of the astronomy and, and these texts and looking at them. I, you know, I've got perhaps I'm wrong, but I think James P. Allen, although very learned in his particular area, is probably not very um, knowledgeable in the in the astronomy, and and that's why it, probably one of the reasons why so often it's overlooked because those who uh, uh, great at reading um, the hieroglyphs um, more power and great to them thank you for the work that they do however they've been institutionalized in a sense and also because they tend to be from the humanities and tend to have a, uh, a certain idea um, a, a worldview that they want to they, they want to see these things in a certain context and rather than um, Susan Bryn Morrow, who's looking at them in a multidisciplined concept. And I think, well, that's the way we need to go and need to examine these things. And again, these symbols, which is essentially missing from all of the major translations of the pyramid text, coffin text, and book of the dead. Uh, well, this is, it's, I, personally, for me, it's evident. Uh, the architecture, the texts, and the astronomy, and the, the, the increased number of studies into these things are just, again, pointing. Uh, to this, and so Mesketu, opening the mouth ceremony, the alignment of all these temples uh, to the North Star, just the, the practical importance of the North Star, the descriptions such as stretching the cord and the timekeeper and the merket and the progressive movement of the stars. Um, I think it's a translator's job to translate, not to translate to make it understandable to the modern audience, because then you're going to exclude this astronomical information and then uh, you're going to put it in a purely religious sense. And so from the earliest records to the uh, later records, such as the uh, Dendera Zodiac, the Hippopotamus tethered to the Mesketu, the North Star, the Ads and those same things, it's all there. And so uh, I'll link this article, I'll drop the full PDF of the translations of the Pyramid Text by James P. Allen, and I think the important point is to read through the preface, not the actual 
the text as well, but read through the preface and see what is not mentioned in there. It is just repeated in a very purely religious, magical spell uh, sense, and there is it's the absence of archaeoastronomy references to the importance of the seasons, especially the flood season. Is is well that it's very the silence is is deafening um, in that sense, and even the interpretations of words such as ark and arket, if you compare it to Budge or the Gardener um, hieroglyph dictionaries as well, you see that it is it's it, you know to be blunt, he it, it, it is very very biased to one side, and the amount that is missing in these. The traditional interpretations, I think, is well um, a, a grave mistake. Uh, uh, I think, in his own words, it is a serious misrepresentation of the pyramid text not to have this multidiscipline approach. And you know, the pyramids were not just piled up. Uh, the other temples show extraordinary levels of engineering and science, and uh, of course the the importance of the stars and the heavens in these texts as well. Well, I think it's fair to be read. It's just revisited. It's purely, it's evident in the architecture. It's, and uh, more and more studies of uh, and uh, uh, scholarly articles, revision of these older texts compared to new information, more multidisciplined information, is going to eventually peel this older version back. So clearly they had a religion, uh, religious aspects, and but it was based on science versus this pure religious, purely superstitious, magical spell interpretation. Well, um, yeah, okay, not much more to be said on that. Uh, Mesquite you, uh, SGD, you can visit this PayPal account if you want to contribute to the channel. But uh, once you see and once you start to understand the the astronomy, the architecture of there, and then look at these symbols and how it connects to other texts, especially stretching the cord and pyramid alignments, the opening of the mouth ritual as well as the larger pyramid texts as well, have quite a bit of tangible, measurable, testable information in there, and that just seems to be missing from the more general... Um, descriptions of, of ancient Egypt, but also this would apply to Sumer and to other civilizations as well, where we tend to project our superior notions of, of intellect and understanding and uh, and assume that these people were overly, purely superstitious, but I, I would argue very strongly against that, that it's just, it's evident, it, re like I, it is evident once you um, view beyond just the purely religious superstition start to appreciate the technology involved in, in their architecture and the sophistication of their astronomy and just, yes, more and more information is, is coming forth on this and, and we need to you know, include all of the information and, and revisit and, and test the, the older, I would say, very biased uh, projections of the unsophisticated peoples as opposed to our modern viewpoints of thinking we're at the end of it all. You also notice again that Mesquite uh, constellation symbol in there as well. Yes, yeah, so anyway, so hope you enjoyed. Have a good one and um, if you'd like to contribute you can find the link in the description to this PayPal account. And with that, I say thank you for watching and have a good one. Cheers.